Let's take a second to look at some of the things you're going to need in order to make this project successful. Well, you're going to need a good supply of wine bottles, champagne grade wine bottles. You're going to need champagne stoppers. Now for the home winemaker, the plastic stoppers seem to work best. I've used the, uh, uh, the ringed ones before and I've had some breakdown over long periods of time and they've lost their carbonation. I've had great success with this style. You're going to need cages in order to keep those corks in and you're also, well it's helpful to have a cage twister to get a nice twist in that uh, cage so that it holds things down properly and evenly. You're going to need a glass to try it out. And you might need a flashlight. I'm just going to use my phone light in order to backlight the bottle to make a, a good mark of where it, where it is inside. It's good to have your setup somewhere close by a laundry tub or some sort of a sink just because of the amount of water that's flowing with the cleaning process you're also going to make a mess at some point and you're going to have to clean that up so it's good to be close. You're going to need a couple of towels because for sure you're going to make a mess and also a mop. You'll notice maybe on the back that there's some splatter. There has been a few uh, overflows over the years and typically what that comes from is imperfections inside the bottle won't allow the wine uh, to set or the tree to settle down and also lately I've noticed there's a slight leak in the air valve that's causing some disturbance inside the bottle during the bottling process and uh, that's also causing some overflow. Essentially there's three different valves that we need in order to make this tree plus a couple of different T-shaped uh, connectors. So what we have is a gas inlet line, we've got a wine inlet line, and we've got a gas and wine overflow line. Now here's a safety note about the bottles. Uh, it's best to use brand new bottles because uh, they're more likely to be intact. However, if you do recycle your bottles or reuse your bottles as I do, it's important that you take the time to inspect each bottle before you use it. Hold it up to a light, check for cracks and imperfections, look inside. You're obviously going to want them to be clean and sterile and uh, ready to use. I've already done that with these bottles and I'm, I've never had a bottle uh, explode on me but uh, my supplier assures me that these large bottles and these ones as well are good for 90 PSI. Now there are some similar looking bottles that you might get uh, cider or perry in. Those are not rated for as high a pressure so you have to make sure that they are actual champagne bottles that are good for 90 PSI. I don't pressurize to 90 PSI, I pressurize lower than that. And that way if there is some error I've got some room uh, to play with. I find too that uh, you can achieve a good mousse without getting up to 90 PSI. Now I've brought my keg of wine in and I've placed it in a chest freezer and that's good because it keeps it cold while you're bottling the wine. As you, uh, If you leave it out in the open it will uh, tend to lose some of its carbonation as it warms up into the keg itself. And that is a, a second keg that I've got that I'm going to be using to sterilize the system. We've got our CO2 tank with our regular... The one gauge shows the tank pressure and the other gauge shows the operating pressure. You've got a valve and this valve here uh, regulates the two pressures, uh, the pressure drop between these two gauges. Now from there we've got a gas line that splits off into a T. One One goes to a gas line hookup that will attach to the tank on the input side. Typically that one's gray. And the other one is the liquid out. That one goes to the other attachment. And together those supply the tree. Now you've got one line here that comes up to the gas input line. What you're going to be doing is you're going to be using that to pressurize the bottle before the wine goes in and this is important so that the wine fills the bottle at the proper speed. Now you'll notice that there's a, a plastic shield. This is Lexan. This is uh, to prevent any breakage from coming towards me while I operate it. Uh, it's a, a good safety feature to have and of course anytime you're doing anything like this you need to have safety glasses and possibly gloves. Uh, the 
we're going to close that valve. It's, an, it's a simple quarter turn to open and close these valves. The liquid or the wine comes up through this tube. We're going to close that one. And this is the uh, bleeder that allows the liquid to go out. We're going to leave that open for now because we're cleaning. But essentially, they mix in the middle, and there's two tubes that I'll show you in a, in a minute that uh, allow the wine into the bottle and then the gas to come out of the bottle because as you uh, fill the bottle with wine the gas that you pressurized it with will have to leave okay so we're going to turn our tank on and that's going to pressurize this keg which has some uh, sulfite citric acid and water in it we just need a little bit of pressure in order to get things moving okay so we've got our sterilizer hooked up and we're going to open the liquid in holding the overflow. Now I've already taken the time to fill this bottle with water so that I don't have to move it from there to there. I'm just running some sulfite through. And once the air starts to come up through this line, I know that it's empty because the, the, uh, the liquid out has a tube that goes straight to the bottom and there's a dimple inside the, the canister that it sits in. Okay, you can hear it coming. Yeah, I hold that on. I hold that tightly because it can move around quite a bit with the air moving through it. Alright, close that off. And we'll just let it sit for five minutes or so to clean anything out. And then I'm going to run some water through there. Okay, so you've got your wine in the freezer. Either you've put it there and left it there till it was the right temperature, or you've had it outside where it's cold and now you've moved it inside. That'll keep it cold while we're doing the bottling process. So we're gonna turn on the tank and make our connections with our gas in and our liquid out. Put that in behind. Okay, so we've got a clean bottle in place. We've clamped it with our clamp up into the rubber stopper. And we're ready to go. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set the speed of the fill. The speed is very important. You don't want it too fast and you don't want it too slow. It's good to have a flashlight for this process so that you can see. Let me just turn mine on. Okay. You can backlight with a flashlight in order to see the film more accurately. Okay, so the first step is to pressurize the bottle. We open up the gas line. Now, if it's going to blow, this is when it's going to happen because right now the bottle is at ambient room temp pressure and when you pressurize it to, in this case, 50 psi, you're going to find out if there's any fractures. Okay, once you hear the gas stop flowing, the bottle is pressurized. We're going to open the liquid in all the way and we're just gently going to crack the overflow valve till we hear some noise. And this is crucial, you don't want it open all the way or the wine will come out too fast. I don't know if you can hear that hiss. That's the gas in the bottle exiting through the overflow hose. And if you can have a look in there, there is some wine coming out at a pretty slow pace. And that's good. Now once we've got the, the, uh, the speed set, we're going to stop this bottle low by closing the liquid. You leave this gas overflow valve set to that speed and then from now on, you only operate the gas in and the liquid, or the, the gas in and the liquid in valve. Now you can tell when the pressure inside the bottle is stabilized when you stop hearing the hissing sound. Now the reason I stopped this bottle low is because we're going to try it. We want to make sure that the wine is cold enough, otherwise it might not be holding enough pressure. We want to check to make sure that the pressure is, or that the carbonation is stable for at least half an hour. And we're also going to use that for top up if something happens later on. Now 
Now at this point, if the bottle were, were full, I would be a little bit more careful because I wouldn't want it to overflow. But we're going to pour some into a glass. Now, as I said, this is sparkling Riesling ice wine. There definitely appears to be lots of carbonation. That's a good wine! Alright, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go for dinner, and if that's still bubbly in half an hour, I'm good to go. Now, unfortunately, at this stage, in the past, I have had to stop because there wasn't enough carbonation in the wine, especially when you're doing uh, artificial carbonation. And, you know, you may have to leave it for another day or so and go through the whole process of cleaning all this equipment, even though you've only filled a quarter of a bottle of wine. But it's important because you've put a lot of effort into it at this point and you want to make sure that you finish it properly. Okay, so what I did was I turned the pressure up to 55 PSI and I left it sitting in the freezer. It was cool but not cold. A little note on that, if you put it out in the garage, let's say, and it's zero degrees outside, your garage is not going to be zero. It might be plus two or plus four. Of course, these temperatures are in Celsius. And then the wine inside the can is going to be slightly warmer as well. Uh, the carbonation that you achieve through artificial carbonation is a factor of the temperature of the wine and the pressure of the gas that you're putting into it and the viscosity of the liquid. There's some liquid components there. So it really is a shot in the dark for the home winemaker because we have no way of knowing the exact temperature of the wine that's inside. We have no way of knowing how much of that carbon dioxide was absorbed and how much is sitting up in the headspace. This was, because I did ice wine this time, it was only half full. It was only 12 liters of wine in there. So uh, it did persist for half an hour, but it was very faint. Now, when you send a wine in for judging, they judge on mouthfeel. They don't judge on the appearance in the glass for carbonation. Uh, they say it needs to be persistent, but that's a persistent mouthfeel of carbonation. And indeed, there was quite a bit of uh, CO2 in the mouthfeel, just not quite what I was looking for. So, I think we're ready now, and I'm going to do another small segment to try it out. Too fast. I think that's probably good. You don't want to be here all night. Now I'm going to stop it when it gets up into the neck. There's a small amount of wine in the fill tube that will fall down into the bottle as well and you'll get some overflow because of the uh, agitation. Okay, now I don't know if you can see that, but there's quite a bit of fizz in the neck, but it's going down quickly, which is good. Lots of fizz coming out. You'll notice I turned the tank off. There's a small leak in this system that's allowing air CO2 to leak into the bottle at that stage, and that, I found, was agitating it. So, I've got my stopper, put it in the bottle, And then put on a cage. Now don't be in too much of a rush to go through this because at this point there's been a destabilization inside the keg and it's good to let it sit for a minute and keep on building that pressure back up. I've just put the cork in the bottle and the wire cage goes on top. Now it's a bit of a trick but you want to hold that cage so that it comes up underneath of the lip. Then you hook the end like so, and you sort of pull it out so that the back side of the wire catches the rim. Holding everything in place, you just spin it. Once you get it going, you can lift it up, and that action there gives you your nice tight spin. You can reuse these things if you're careful.